So good afternoon. Hey, folks. So this is Shivram, and my co-presenter is uh, Alex Tichenko. So we're going to talk about two guys. Uh, it's not the two of us. We're going to talk about two guys, Hawk and Hive. And uh, the focus is on how Hawk uh, coexists and lives in the Hive ecosystem. So this, all of these efforts were mostly done in the last two or three years to get Hawk to be like a very good citizen in the Hive and HDFS ecosystem. And the topic is querying unmanaged data. So the agenda would, uh, oops, yeah. So we'll start off with an overview of Apache Hawk because I guess uh, I'm not sure how many folks here are so, I mean, so aware of the internals of Hawk. So we're going to give you a glimpse of what Hawk is about, the architecture of Hawk, along with uh, when you fire a query, how it runs through the different phases within Hawk. Uh, so the goal is by the end of it, before we get into the Hive integration, we want folks here to understand uh, what are the salient fa uh, facets of Hawk and how Hawk is different from other uh, SQL database on Hadoop. Uh, following that, we'll transition to the extension framework, which is the means by which Hawk can access data that's on external data sources, right? So, which includes Hive. So, a natural transition would be the Hawk and Hive integration, followed by Hawk and H catalog integration. So, going to the lineage, so it goes all the way back to maybe the time when most of us didn't use a laptop, like 30 years back, when uh, Postgres was incepted uh, from Berkeley. And uh, so over the years, Postgres evolved into a very mature and uh, traditional relational database, which uh, came from academia, but which got a lot of enterprise adoption and traction. So around 2005 was when Greenplum effectively took Postgres as a foundation and uh, made an MPP-based system with Postgres as its backbone. So as Greenplum kept going uh, over the years, uh, that's when Hadoop 1.2 and when 2.0 effectively came in and stamped its footprint as, okay, it is enterprise worthy. Uh, so that's when we had to take in Greenplum and evolve that into a system that not only worked on appliances and on like hardware that's, uh, you can't really call them commodity hardware. Back in 2005, it was mostly working on, these, on appliances which are fairly uh, large. We had to get it to evolve into working on like fairly unreliable commodity nodes, which is the whole thing with Hadoop, right? So that's when Hawk was born in 2012. So we got all the aspects and all the goodies from Postgres and Greenplum, and we evolved that at, into Hawk, which effectively was Greenplum on HDFS, with obviously a lot of changes. And fast forward two years, we were able to open source that, uh, and it's an Apache incubator at this point. And as we speak, we're working, we're putting all our blood and sweat towards uh, taking, making this a top-level project. So that's the uh, snapshot of the whole lineage and where we are right now. Okay, so Hawk overview. So this, I could spend a whole day just explaining the components within this slide, but I'm gonna probably restrict it to 10 minutes. Uh, so in its core, right, so uh, if you look at the top left side, uh, which says leverage existing SQL skills and BI tools. Uh, so a primary premise for Hawk was to make sure somebody would transition from a traditional data warehouse or a traditional database like the likes of Oracle or Teradata on Netiza, we wanted to make the experience to be as seamless as possible. So you could just take all of your schemas and your DDLs and just basically push them into Hawk, which I'm sure a lot of you folks on the data processing side, you know what kind of a nightmare it is to load all of your SQL statements into a different database, right? I'm not picking and choosing what is good and bad, but that was one of our major, uh, what do you call, that, that was a big priority for us. So and we made it ANSYS SQL compliant to standards 92, 99, 2003, and when I'm saying ANSI SQL compliant, I'm not using the term loosely. Uh, we are very strictly ANSI SQL 2003 compliant. And uh, obviously, you have the things which no database can, cannot live with, right? So things like JDBC, ODBC connectivity, and uh, OLAP extensions. So moving on to the right, uh, I'm going to talk about core and extensibility. Some of them go hand in hand. So in its core, uh, it's an MPP-based architecture. So MPP, I mean, there's research on MPP, which goes all the way to like 1970s. So in its core, MPP is nothing but uh, a parallel shared nothing architecture. So when I'm saying shared nothing architecture, it means you split a problem into mul multiple executors, and each executor has its own dedicated hardware, CPU, memory, so on and so forth. And it doesn't share any data uh, with other executors. So we had to evolve that MPP architecture, which came from GPDB and Greenplum, and make it work with HDFS, which uh, was fairly challenging, but given that HDFS uh, one executor could still look at data which is written by another executor because it's 
HDFS at the end of the day, right? So we kind of had to get those two to uh, come together. Uh, and then support for transactions was very key for us. So our transaction support goes at multiple isolation levels. Firstly being uh, repeatable reads. So repeatable reads are nothing but uh, when you enter into a transaction, you look at what was snapshotted, what was the snapshot data prior to the transaction, right? And as long as you're within the transaction, you're never gonna be bothered or worried about what another transaction does. So that's repeatable reads. That's one simple level of isolation that we provide. Uh, another class of isolations fall under two categories. One is repeatable reads, uh, sorry, one is read committed, and another one is read uncommitted. As the name indicates, read committed means uh, when you're within the transaction, you should be able to see commits that were sent by other transactions that are going on concurrently. So that's a bit more challenging, so, but that's what we have by default. By default, when you launch transactions in Hawk, they are read committed, and the third transaction isolation level is read uncommitted, and you're basically opening up a can of worms when you're able to read uncommitted data, right? So, but we do support these three, but with the default being read committed transaction isolation level. And uh, dynamic pipelining was also another key thing, and the core, I mean, to mention what dynamic pipelining is in a couple of lines is, Effectively, can you run a task without having to spill data onto disk, right? So you run data and it provides, uh, there's some response that it creates, which resides in memory. You should be able to stream this output to another executor which could run uh, on the same node or on another node directly without having to spill to disk. Uh, so that, that's the whole approach of dynamic pipelining where you go task by task without having to spill to disk. So apart from these things, uh, Manageability aspects like integration with Ambari, uh, on, the, on the extreme right side, the granular authorization, we, we've got that with the integration with the Ranger, which there was a session done by Alex and the folks from Hortonworks yesterday, where they spoke about how Hawk and Ranger integrates. And uh, last but not least is the cost based optimizer. So the cost based optimizer is actually a project with the code name Orca. So it's, it's a separate project but it's done really in a modular way wherein you could actually have any, cust any database in theory could actually go and talk to Orca. And what Orca does is effectively it takes, a query, it takes your query, evaluates all the query plans, and gives you the most optimal plan. And it's proven to work with all sorts of BI uh, queries that come in. And typically the BI queries that come in from UI tools are not really folks, I mean if somebody really writes that by hand, I mean he has to be really nuts to write them but you're not really going to monitor and uh, evaluate a query that a, BI, a UI tool gives you, right? So Orca can scale to like 1,000 table joins or even, even more than that. So, and Orca has its own diverse ecosystem with a lot of committers working on it, and it's being used by both Hawk and Greenplum. So we have th that entire community who's working on the query optimizer, which is currently the default within Hawk. So that kind of, I'm, I'm, ho I'm hoping people have like a decent overview of Hawk, what Hawk is in its core. And from here, I'm going to transition to uh, the components in Hawk. Nothing fancy here. It's, it's effectively a master and uh, one or more segments. Segments are similar to your slaves or your workers in the HDFS space, right? Uh, the segments run alongside the data nodes, and the master is its own thing, right? Similar to the name node. And the master also has a standby master. And the way by which we replicate data from the Hawk master to the standby master is by means of a write ahead log. So we use this, we call it as wall in short form, WL. And the wall replication is primarily to replicate uh, transaction information and uh, catalog metadata. Because Hawk Master stores catalog metadata locally, but obviously data is not stored locally, right? Data is on HDFS, so you don't have to store, you don't have to replicate data from the master to the standby master. Uh, well, all that is being replicated and is being uh, communicated from the master to the mirror is just the schema changes and uh, anything that goes with transaction updates. And uh, on the Hawk master side, uh, so I'll pick a couple of, maybe three or four of them. So obviously it does the query parsing and it talks to the query optimizer, which is what I mentioned in the previous slide, Orca, that runs in the Hawk master. And Hawk master also negotiates with Yarn uh, to get the appropriate number of resources for your query. Uh, apart from that, it does, it has a transaction manager residing within it. And uh, a very key thing is also we cache the name node uh, metadata. Because within a, we don't want to keep talking to the name node over and over with every single request because just the RPC overhead is way too much for a system like Hawk to handle. I mean, especially with the SLAs we have with Hawk on, a, on the execution time. So we cache all the name node metadata uh, within the session. 
And last but not least, obviously, the Hawk Master dispatches any given query to the Hawk segments, which are your worker nodes. Uh, and the segment, like I said earlier, are the ones which actually do all the work, right? So you have one or more segments, which are generally alongside each data node. And, uh, and what you see there as virtual segments effectively means a segment doesn't have like static processes. The number of processes that come up is effectively based on the, num the kind of a query workload you have. So if you have a query which has to join like 100, 100 tables, you have probably 1,000 executors that come up on each segment. So the, we, those are called virtual segments. And if your query workload is like super small, all that you need is one virtual segment, you're just going to get one virtual segment or an executor. So the term virtual segment and query executor are kind of similar. I'll use that interchange interchangeably. And a key aspect here is we don't use, uh, I mean, it's all C-based, right? I mean, I should have probably mentioned that earlier. Hawk is entirely C-based in its core. So which means we don't have, uh, uh, there are no C-client APIs today, right? So at least really the ones which, they're not as popular as the Java APIs. So we had to build our own libhtvs 3 which was an advanced version of, uh, there was libhtvs prior to us building libhtvs 3 but we weren't happy with its performance, so we built our own libhtvs 3 which is also open source. Uh, the primary reason is we didn't want to have any of the overheads with using JNI or any Java adapter to do a context switch from C to Java. That would have really killed us in performance. So we use libhtfs 3 for the Hawk segments to talk to data uh, on HDFS. Okay, so now to fit all of these together uh, and see how it comes in the big picture, right? So you have Hawk Master above the horizontal line, and uh, you have all the segments or your workers below that. Right, so, and what you see in between is a layer called interconnect. So that is nothing but the means by which, uh, like any MPP system, when your workers work on parallel activities, they have to have a means of shuffling data, right? It's not too different from MapReduce or, or Spark. You, you work on individual stuff, at the end of the day, you still have to shuffle when you're trying to do group buys or joins. All, all of that is done using the interconnect. So for that, Hawk has an interconnect layer that we have built, and that's based on UDP. For obvious reasons, we don't want to have the overhead of really large uh, packet acknowledgement and stuff. But we have a very, very lightweight uh, packet verification uh, approach built in on top of UDP. So that allows us to have a really fast interconnect. And yes, we do require that any customer uses Hawk has to have pretty fast switch to, to power this interconnect layer. Uh, so once a query comes into the Hawk master, right? Once the user finds any, fires any select query, uh, it goes through the query dispatcher, the usual suspects. It goes through the parser, the query runs through the planner, which is the optimizer, and finally a query plan is, is produced, right? Uh, so once the query plan is available, and Hawk also knows, since it has the name node uh, data cached locally for all the tables which Hawk owns, uh, so now you're in a position to say, I want these many resources from Yarn, and I want them to be on like certain number of hosts, right? Because you want to make sure that there's a little, there is co-location and processing and data storage. So now uh, we fire a, a request to Yarn Resource Manager saying, hey, I want five containers with certain CPU and certain memory, and along with the list of hosts where I want these containers to be available. So I get back that, along with the number of containers in the servers where these containers are available, and Hawk now would use this pool, and now that we have this pool available uh, within Hawk, within these segments, Hawk would now uh, send, communicate to these various segments saying, uh, it will communicate all those processes which are long living, and those processes now are responsible for launching uh, these virtual segments, which are these dynamic executors that come up, and those are nothing but similar, that would use the containers which were given to us by the resource manager. So you would see two virtual segments in server one, two in server n, and one in server two, which kind of maps to what you see on top. And the dispatch that was done here obviously takes into consideration that the data, data, data co-location should be as good as possible, but it's not always guaranteed. And we try as far as possible to make sure that the requests are dispatched to uh, segments where the data resides. So once that's done, uh, you're now ready to dispatch the query plan to each of these virtual segments. And uh, the virtual segments does what it does, right? It talks to HDFS using libhtfs 3 and uh, it gets the data. And once the data is available, things that go on with like operations such as group by, join, or sort, which requires shuffling data across the different executors, would now happen using the interconnect layer that I spoke about, the UDP-based interconnect layer. 
And finally, the result is sent back to the Hawk master, and the user, I guess, is happy now. OK, so just to summarize why Hawk uh, can perform as, as good, good as it is. Uh, and its core, like I said, it's an MPP-based architecture which came from various, uh, like the proven Greenplum technology, along with the cost-based optimizer, which is based on uh, Orca. And uh, so the dynamic pipelining allows us to never have to go to uh, disk for intermediate, write, intermediate writes. We never spill to disk. So everything runs within the memory and gets streamed from one executor to another. And the fast interconnect that we have allows the segments to shuffle data uh, in a really fast manner. And the two other important aspects here is the metadata cache that we have. Like I said earlier, we don't have to have too many name node RPC lookups to go and fetch metadata for each table over and over. We cache all of them locally. And last but not, but the, last not, not the least is obviously the native scanner that we have, which is based on C++ and it's libhtfs3, which is also open source. So, uh, and so based on all those uh, efficiencies that we gain with performance, this is where we are with performance. Uh, so Hawk and Impala, so we have kind of taken one of the, we're not really skewed in any of our benchmarks. This is as straightforward as it can go. Uh, so Hawk and Impala on the performance side, we are about 1.3x faster, more or less the same. But the key aspect here is uh, on the right side, what you would see, you see some of the color coded cells. They're a combination of queries that were either not supported or queries that just kept running beyond a time, beyond a particular time limit or queries that just exceeded the memory limit, right? So about 47, close to 50% of queries and the main keyword there is unmodified. We didn't want to go, obviously we wanted the experience to be similar to what a BI guy would do. So you, typically you just want to run the SQL query as how we're used to, right? So the unmodified SQL queries, about 50% of them failed in Impala versus uh, 100 of the TPC DS queries. We had no failure, especially within the given time limits within Hawk. So that kind of indicates the fact that when you're ANSI SQL compliant and when you have an architecture which is as sound as we are, uh, this is one of the outcomes. Yes, so we want to run more uh, recent benchmarks. So things are going to be, uh, just, look, just look for, uh, we'll be publishing newer benchmarks in our uh, blog sometime soon. So I'll now pivot to uh, managed versus unmanaged data, right? So all this while I've been talking about data that's managed by Hawk. So when I'm saying managed data, I'm referring to data which is written into Hawk. So when you insert data into Hawk, uh, Hawk knows where the data is located. It has all the schema, schema information, so on and so forth. It has statistics and all that. But in the real world, it's not as simple as that, right? As that, right? So folks would use all sorts of data processing layers. They could use Spark to ingest data. They could use another, you might have a stream processing that just gets into it. Or Hive could be used as a primary means of data processing. So when you have these hybrid, when you have this kind of a hybrid approach, the goal is how do you somehow get Hawk, which is used to managing its own catalog, to fit well with external data systems which run on the same cluster. So that's what we call managed versus unmanaged data. So we're now going to focus this talk more on the unmanaged data side and how we go about talking to external data sets and how that fits with the Hive integration. So for, towards that, we build this, uh, we call it as extension, uh, we had to, uh, expand Hawk to also have an extension framework, which is also known as PXF. And this extension framework was built in Java, and one of the reasons we chose Java was the community was key for us, right? So Hawk being a C-based uh, MPP engine, uh, with all the pluses of C, you're not gonna get a large community when, when you have a C-based product, which is a good thing and a bad thing at the same time, right? So for that, we wanted to make sure that the extensibility aspect of Hawk, meaning the ability to, to, to talk to, say, Cassandra or any given data format, Parquet, ORC, any custom format that's being built, carbon data or whatever. We wanted that to be built by any external developer. So, and the goal for the PXF framework is for that. So what it does is it effectively connects to any heterogeneous data source, and it provides, it converts that to a uniform tabular view. And I'm saying tabular view, it effectively converts an unstructured data to a simple record representation, which a SQL-like engine like Hawk can effectively understand, right? So parallelism is obviously, it's a given, right? You can't have any system without parallelism. And uh, like I said earlier, we chose Java and the pluggability aspect was a big thing, so that we wanted uh, folks from outside of Pivotal to be able to provide custom connectors to any given data source on, on HDFS. And uh, we ship with a bunch of built-in connectors, like connectors for HDFS, Hive, and HBase, like the usual suspects. 
uh, and with all the well-known formats, but there are a lot of uh, connectors that are being built by external developers. I'm going to, I think the next slide has some of them. Uh, and for a custom connector to be built by, for, for any given format, it's as simple as extending three classes. One class is to just, A, say how do you partition the external data, and the second class is to be able to read the given partition, and the third class is to resolve uh, a record in the partition to a record which Hawk can understand. So it's just, we just have to extend three classes. So believe me, if you go through the sandbox and go through a tutorial, you'll, re you'll realize how easy it is to build your own connector to a custom data format. So in terms of the architecture of how PXF, how this extension framework fits with Hawk, uh, Hawk talks, Hawk which is in C talks to this extension framework which is in Java using REST APIs. So we wanted to keep them Although it's, it lives together, we wanted to keep them isolated. And the PXF runs as independent JVMs alongside all the data nodes, right? So you have Hawk segments running, you have uh, data nodes running, and you also have the PXF JVM running alongside each of the data node. Uh, and when Hawk needs to access an external, say an ex external HPS table, for instance, Hawk would send a REST API to uh, PXF, and PXF has uh, the necessary code built into Talk, uh, to talk and understand HPS APIs and also be able to resolve a HPS record to a Hawk record. That's all part of the PXF framework. So uh, the built-in connectors are as, as shown above with various different formats, and uh, the ones below are all stuff that we got from the community, uh, Solar, Redis, so on and so forth. So I'll now transition to Alex, and he's gonna talk about more about the extension framework and about accessing ex external data and transition into the Hive integration. about, yeah. Hello again, I'm Alex, and I'd like to continue a story which Sharam already started, and the story, story is about uh, Hawk and high integration. So Sharam already showed us a query execution flow for native tables, and now let's see what the query execution flow looks like for external tables. So first of all, a user runs a query with external table. It goes to Hawk master, and first thing we should think about is we need to parallelize our processing, because it's MPP. And uh, for that, we need to split our external table to partitions. And for that matter, uh, Hawk talks to PXF. PXF uh, talks to name node. And after that, we know a uh, list of our partitions going into the table, and we uh, get uh, metadata of partitions. And by, by metadata, I mean mostly allocation of that partition on particular host. So once we get that uh, partition list, uh, Transition uh, execution flow goes to partition mapper component. And partition mapper component, it uh, implements uh, logic of mapping uh, which partition will be processed by which segment. And our initial implementation, it was relying fully on um, data locality, uh, but we ended up with overloading some of very few uh, segments and we're not using the full uh, segment pool. So we decided to balance between data locality we try to read uh, local data as much as possible, but in, in the same time, we try to leverage as much as possible a uh, number of segments. So that's, that's the current logic. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, Hawk Master, it uh, dispatches a query with certain partitions to uh, segments. And in this example, uh, segment one is responsible for partition one, for partition four, uh, segment two is responsible for partition five, and so on and so forth. So once, uh, segment um, got their partitions, which they sh should read, uh, they, sh they, uh, they uh, start virtual segment. One virtual segment uh, per one partition. So uh, once we have virtual segment, they start talking to PXF, and some of you might think that PXF here looks like a bottleneck, but it's not true because that was our intention. We didn't want to have like multiple uh, GVMs because it's unnecessary overhead. Instead of that, we just uh, handle each uh, virtual request segment in separate thread. That was enough. So uh, after that, uh, PXF reads uh, data from HDFS. It does some data conversion if needed to format which Hawk can understand. And we started starting uh, establishing pipelines, streaming data back from virtual segment to uh, Hawk Master. On Hawk Master, we need to do some global ag aggregation function. And after that, uh, query is getting back to user. Um, so we didn't want uh, Hawk to be thin in itself. We wanted it to be good citizen, and that's why we wanted it to be interoperable with other uh, Hadoop and SQL engines. And one of the engines was a Hive, pretty remarkable engine, so we started uh, focusing on more tight integration. 
So as uh, Shavram mentioned before, we have this PXM framework in which you can build uh, multiple profiles or connectors. So we started from the uh, profile called Hive. Um, it was kind of the, the very ultimate way for us to access any Hive table. Uh, it worked for heterogeneous table. It means that if you have table with multiple partitions and each partition might have its own format, uh, that profile covers that case. So we, we were also getting the all uh, Hive supported formats for free, but obviously it was not optimized for uh, particular f f format, so it was, uh, performance was not, not that great. So we decided to build a bunch of uh, profiles for particular uh, popular f file format. First of all, we built uh, Hive uh, RC. As you can see from name, it's, uh, it supported Hive uh, record columnar format. Uh, next thing, it came up, uh, we came up with Hive text profile. In Hive text profile, we tried something else. So before, we were always operating on records or tuples. So we were just reading like record by record. We were doing some data conversion record by record. That was sometimes not that fast. So we decided to try uh, the chunks of data. And uh, uh, in terms of data resolution, we moved the data resolution part to Hawk segment. And Hawk segment naturally has more resources, more CPU, so it was faster. And also, it's written in C, so it gives its benefits. But on the flip side, only text-derived uh, data types were supported, uh, which was okay for some use cases. Uh, but then we uh, wanted to support uh, RC. It was very hard at the time. And uh, yeah, we built this high RC profile. Uh, we tried to leverage all benefits of RC, such as uh, predicates pushdowns, column projections, and it performed very well. And the next profile, which we still are working on, is high vectorized RC. It also uses uh, RC batch API. Uh, we read uh, uh, batch, which usually 1,024 rows. And it, we also, instead of resolving uh, row by row, we're trying to resolve column by column, which sometimes give you optimization in terms of uh, CPU cache and stuff like that. So it's, it, I think it, it gave like a 15 or 20 percent of performance gain. Um, so before before a high RC profile came in, we were effectively running uh, select star uh, on each segment for partition. So it was not that good, but given the fact that all formats, they weren't columnar or they didn't support column projection, predicate put down, it was okay. But with RC, it was not acceptable. So we had to, along with partition, as I said before, we had to modify Hawk and PXF in such a way that we have to send other uh, query attributes, such as uh, projected columns. We were also using a reverse Polish notation to encode our predicates. And um, we were sending aggregate functions as well, if they are present. So one segment gets that additional information. It uh, talks to PXF. PXF uses those attributes, passes them as parameters to our CAPI. And here you can see that instead of a uh, big RC file, we read in just a small portion of it, and which obviously uh, you don't need to, to read it. You, you want to push it down as much as possible. Another thing which we were thinking about is uh, RC file has some statistics. So having this statistic, you can uh, give answer to some of your basic aggregate functions, such as count star, for example. So we did some optimization there as well at some point. So uh, as a summary of our optimization uh, in general for the whole framework, uh, if you're running inside of database, you care about statistics. Because if you build in your plan, it depends whether whether your record, whether your table is big or small, so your plan will, your plan will be affected by that. So, uh, because of that, uh, we uh, through, through PXF we expose our statistics. So we, uh, so our, our pl planner was aware of nature of our external data. So we were trying to operate uh, on external tables as much as we operate on nature tables. Other thing which I already mentioned is column projection and predicate pushdown. Initially, we built them for high RC, but uh, after that we, ex we extended that to the whole framework. So all uh, columnar uh, formats will be benefit from it as well. Other thing is, uh, should we operate on batches or tuples? So for most of the profiles, we operate on tuples, but some profiles such as Hive text and Hive vectorized RC, we operate on batches. And uh, also lazy data resolution, uh, we tried to uh, move data resolution as, uh, to uh, Hawk segment and re resolve data as late as possible. That was the idea. So at some point, we already had quite a performant half hoc uh, integration. It worked well, but user experience was not that great. So as you can see on the left part of slide, uh, user had to go to hoc, they had to create external table, and they need to know uh, Hive to hoc data mapping, they need to know PXF port, they need to know location, some configuration parameters. This is not a very pleasant uh, experience. Also, imagine if somebody goes to Hive and updates uh, 
let's say, adds a column or stuff, stuff like that, user have to go back to uh, hawk and update external table as well. That was not uh, pleasant. So our goal was to uh, user to be able to query data from a Hive table right away without creation any intermediate external tables. We uh, wanted, we didn't want them to know about uh, Hive, hawk to Hive data types mapping, some conservation perimeter, stuff like that. And also, also important thing is we wanted metadata be always uh, up to date. Uh, so we were thinking uh, that we should come up with some catalog unification. And you, you, you can know that a uh, lot of uh, Hadoop with SQL engine, they have edge catalog as their native uh, storage, a native uh, metadata storage. So we were also thinking that probably we can fit our uh, hawk catalog data in this uh, edge catalog uh, diagram, right? But if you look at uh, uh, Hawk catalog, which we inherited from Postgres and from Greenplum, is like uh, 80 uh, tables, and it's probably not a good idea to fit it into edge catalog. So we decided that we should um, definitely should query information from edge catalog to Hawk catalog during the query execution time. Uh, so uh, we had a couple of challenges. We had a couple of considerations. Uh, how do we import the information from each catalog? Uh, should we persist it or shouldn't we? Uh, how do we store it and stuff like that? So first option for us was to query each catalog data uh, to Hawk and persist it on disk, as we do for uh, regular uh, Hawk catalog information. Uh, first of all, it required us very few Hawk changes, and we were getting all catalog utilities for free. But on the flip side, uh, catalog would be polluted with a uh, lot of external data information which you don't even control. and um, also, you will not get in uh, session isolation because edge catalog objects will be visible to concurrent sessions, and we definitely didn't want that to happen. Other option was to not persist uh, edge catalog data in disk, but just keep it in memory during the session time. It, it provided us session level isolation. Uh, your uh, cleanup process is very cheap because you have just to, once your session is done, you have just to um, clean your uh, memory region, that's it. On the flip side, uh, our whole catalog service need to be aware of edge catalog. Uh, and also our catalog utilities, they needed to be modified to work with edge catalog object as well. But with all those pros and cons, we decided to go with second approach. So uh, we decided to uh, ingest data in memory and once a uh, session is done, we just erase it. That was our decision. Uh, another thing which I have to mention, another, another uh, challenge was uh, object ID namespace. Because in a uh, uh, hawk catalog, each object such as table or column or partition uh, has to have uh, object ID. And this is like a precise uh, resource for us and we have uh, four billion pool for object IDs. And we had temptation to use that pool for uh, object ID for edge catalog obje object as well. But we would just uh, very, very fast, very, very quick exhaust that uh, pool and we didn't want that. Uh, so we just decided to allocate 10 million values out of that 4 billion values strictly for edge catalog objects. And for each, each session, as you can see, we would have a uh, counter per session. And once your session is uh, ended, you just uh, drop those objects. That was our solution with the um, object ID. So with, with all being said before, uh, we came up with uh, this design and uh, here how it looks like the flow. So uh, let's say user has to query some data from a uh, hive. Uh, they should use edge catalog as a keyword. Then we should specify a hive database name and we should specify a table name in hive. Uh, so let's say this, we start session with this query. It comes to Hawk. Then Hawk uh, talks to a Hawk catalog service. It tries to get metadata for this web log uh, table from memory. Obviously it's not there yet. So Hawk uh, talks to edge catalog. It queries information about web log table. It gets a list of columns, data types, uh, basic statistics, and uh, some uh, uh, but, uh, primary keys and uh, constraints. So once we get this information, we return it back to Hawk catalog service. We store it in memory. Um, and after that, we just uh, proceed with this table as a regular PXF external table. We treat it as a regular table and we proceed with regular PXF read and flow. So let's say uh, next query uh, comes in in the same session, uh, the same table, but different query. Uh, it comes to Hawk and uh, Hawk talks to catalog service again. And it happens that we already have this information in memory available. So we just read it from memory and proceed with our uh, regular uh, reading flow. That was the flow. Uh, so uh, in, your, in your Hadoop, uh, in your Hadoop uh, ecosystem, you might, run, you might run a hive, which uh, optimized to hold very detailed information. It uh, supports a lot of data sources. It provides a pretty good low to medium query latency. Uh, it scales to like 100 petabytes. 
you can ask for um, help in uh, established community. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, we have Apache Hawk, which is MVP engine, provides you ad hoc analytics, it provides you low query latency, it scales to hundreds of terabytes, and also machine learning will work out of box. So probably for different type of workloads, you might choose one, of one or another uh, engine, it's up to you. Uh, and at the same time, you definitely don't want data duplication. You don't want to copy data to Hawk and to Hive back and forth. You don't want that. You want to just have a single source of truth. Probably you don't have to uh, make a solution, make, make a decision to uh, use Hive or Hawk, so you might just run them alongside. And with those uh, profiles which we have, they, they provide you very good user experience as long as uh, good performance. So you probably not uh, see difference between a native table or external table. Uh, so, for people who are interested uh, to know more about the project, uh, we have a homepage, we have Hawk Wiki, we have PXF Wiki, uh, we have Sandbox when you can try uh, download it and try it, give it a try. Uh, also, code is available on GitHub on under Apache uh, organization. And uh, if you want to join the conversation, please feel free to subscribe to Dev or User Main List. Uh, thank you. That's it for what we have today. Any questions? Hmm? Any questions? Sure. Go ahead. So we have data automated kind of things. So the you can not expose the BI to tools and then uh, the screen is a big screen. So the BI can bring hex space and just manage it. So is it better than hex space? If you're trying to figure out like how uh, the throughput comes and the error rate. So Hedgebase is entirely for a different workload, right? So you're looking at shorter queries. I mean, if you're trying to build a pseudo transaction processing system or a key value lookup for shorter queries, you're looking at Hedgebase. Your Hawk workloads are typically like, if you look at TPCDS, these are like really great large joins. And uh, I mean, in fact, we do a lot. I mean, if you look at the GPDB Greenplum workloads, which also work in Hawk, these are really complex joins, which typically are completely different from point queries and key value lookups, which HBase is meant for. So the, the use cases are slightly different between HBase and, and Hawk. Did that answer your question? Or? Yeah, I think I can answer. Basically, we, uh, we do get the time table, like two yeah. and get that time table. All, it is, all it needs to run is a single function and then get a result. So, so we just want something to be fast and not take forever to get data. So uh, that's a good question. So LLAP integration, I mean, you get some good things, right? For instance, I mean, the whole, the fact that if Hive cache, if LLAP caches data, which is maybe consumed by Hive, you want them to be observe, uh, visible even from Hawk. That's something that we're working, uh, that's something that's gonna be coming up in the future. So right now, since LLAP is fairly new, we still haven't, uh, even if you run Hive workloads, which would have some data sets cached in memory, we haven't, I mean, and if you run a query with a hawk to access the same data set, we don't uh, look up that cache yet. So, but I think your question is more generic, right? So can you get your workloads to run fast? I mean, there's no, that's, I mean, that's the nature of uh, OLAP queries. I mean, you're not gonna get them to run as fast as a typical HBase query. But, uh, I mean, the benchmarks that we showed, we haven't really compared Hive and Hawk. So the comparison between Impala and Hawk, which was, I mean, if you're looking at a different concurrency use case, it's some 6x faster than Impala. So I would say just give it a shot, just try running your similar OLAP queries on Hawk. Uh, but just to say, uh, Rhea, say that again, your HPS queries, and you would never want to compare Hawk with a HPS query workload. So, yeah. Sure. Uh, no, uh, no, not yet. So we, uh, I mean, we're still working on that. We have like really small benchmarks and the numbers are not too different. And that was primarily done on ORC. But we don't have like, uh, I mean, I think the earlier benchmark that we showed was on 10 and 10, 100 terabytes of data. So we don't have that done on via the extension framework. So, yeah. Yeah.
So with Hawk, the, the, yeah, that's a good question. So with Hawk, when uh, you negotiate for resources with Yarn, right, uh, not every resource is just given back to Yarn when the query is done. So it does still keep a pool of resource, uh, it's still lingering around. Uh, and then if there is another query that comes in, obviously we want to be a good citizen in the whole resource manager management ecosystem, but we do, we don't really uh, relinquish uh, the resources right away. So we do have resources still available for other executors to use them. So uh, I would say we, I mean, 99% of cases we don't spill to disk because our tasks, tasks are small enough to accommodate uh, enough data and memory. But uh, if I actually look through the code and try to, fig if you try to have a debug message on a particular scenario where we do spill to disk, it does happen, but it's really, really rare. The key here is our tasks are much smaller. It's broken down to a granular level to avoid having to spill to disk. Uh, yeah, so but Hawk does, I mean, Hawk is treated as another application, and as Vineet, Vineet uh, is, one, is one of our product managers, he manages most of Hawk. Uh, so we do repeatedly try to request yarn over, over and over for the required number of resources. Yeah. Yeah, so you would use uh, HDP, uh, I mean, it's not HDP, HDB. Uh, I think the product managers would give you the acronym for that. So HDB is a package that we ship, which comes with Ambari off the shelf. You can install Hawk and PXF with the configuration advisor and everything comes, all the freebies. The integration at Ranger was something that we worked on recently. That's all part of it. With the, which your experience is as seamless as integrating high, as Hive uh, being available through Ambari. So, yeah. We're kind of running short of time. I'll probably take one last question from the last guy. Yeah. Uh, nope. Yeah. So when I said uh, ANSI SQL compliance, yes. So I should have said updates and uh, updates and deletes are not supported. But with regards to select. And with multiple multi concurrency, it's it's uh, exact. It's the same uh, level as 2003 ANSI SQL, but we don't have support fancy for, for updates and deletes. Yeah. Thanks, guys. So feel free to catch us and definitely post questions on the couple of subscription lists which Alex pointed. See you guys. Yeah.